159th contact. Sunday, January 10, 1982, 158am. Billy says this is but a surprise. You are probably Electra? Electra says certainly, that's me, and I am very glad to be able to greet you at last. Billy says and just like you, I am also glad. Ever since I held you in my thoughts during the transmissions of the names, I've been wondering about you. You take second place to your sister Manara, however in nothing at all. Quetzal says that should be an honor for you, Electra, when he speaks to you in such a way. It's his own way of expressing his admiration, but as I know him, we aren't everything. Billy says you bring the bronze rose into a quandary, you twit. Quetzal says what did I say? It's still complimentary. Electra says I think the comparison is very lovely. Quetzal says and with that, you are fond of him, of course, but it wasn't expected to be any different. Anyway, I am very glad about that. Billy says to each his own, my son. Quetzal says that is of correctness. Billy says exactly. But you, Electra, be cordially welcomed to the planet of the barbarians. It's often quite funny here, even though sometimes, everything goes wrong. But in any case, it is livable here. Electra says I have already learned various things in this regard. The people of this world seem to be extremely illogical in a lot of things, so they also think and act accordingly. Billy says about that I could sing you a few arias. Electra says. Quetzal says the meaning of his speech is that he could tell you many things about the illogic of the earth human beings. Electra says I see. Quetzal says the descriptive phrases of the earth human beings are very different from ours, as I already explained to you. So if certain things become explained, then the descriptive phrases consist of other forms than the ones known to us. I will still instructively teach you about the most common phrases in the near future. We also had our own troubles with this at the beginning of our contacts. Electra says that's interesting. Billy says you learn it all right, you chocolate angel. Electra says again, I don't understand. Quetzal says chocolate is an earthly confectionery, which is primarily made out of milk, cocoa, and sugar, and which also has a brown color. Therefore, with respect to the color, the earth human beings compare different things to it, whereby it is said that something is chocolate brown. Therefore, the speech of our friend says that you are an angel of chocolate brown color. Electra says I must first accustom myself to these phrases, but I also think this descriptive phrase is lovely. Billy says you have to, yes, because sweet suits sweet. Electra says unfortunately, I don't understand the sense again. Billy says when something is lovely, such as you, my child, then we call this, among other things, also sweet. So you're a sweet thing, just like chocolate. Electra says now I understand. Billy says you see, now I don't have to get you a bicycle. Electra says. Quetzal says you bring Electra into a quandary. Electra says but what does that mean now? Quetzal says if a human being doesn't understand something, so on the earth then the explanation given for this is that his thinking is too slow. Now, if one puts these thoughts on a vehicle, so that they can move faster, then they are able to work faster and achieve their goal, by what means understanding then appears. For this reason, it is said that a bicycle should be used for better and faster understanding. A bicycle is. Billy says a bone shaker or pedal trampler. Quetzal says yes, so these peculiar vehicles are also called, along with many other names. Anyhow, a bicycle is a vehicle that has a metal frame, and on the back and front each, a large wheel is mounted. On the rear part of the frame, there is a small seat, on which the human being sits then, and he puts his feet at the bottom center of the frame on two rotary joints, which he turns with his leg and foot muscles in the direction of travel, by what means the extremely dangerous vehicle moves, 
which the human being steers by means of a handlebar that is firmly fixed above the front wheel in the frame. Billy says man, you are, indeed, a wonder of the bicycle description. I wouldn't have come up with such a perfect description. But that the bicycle should be such a damn dangerous vehicle, that's probably somewhat exaggerated, my son. Quetzal says nevertheless, from our perspective, it is. Billy says certainly for you non-experts. But let's leave this, as such speeches accomplish nothing. I have a question about the names that Electra transmitted to me. Quetzal says we should still talk about that, in any case. Billy says then it is, indeed, good. You see, Electra, we send our thoughts back and forth daily. You do not yet master our language so thoroughly that you can immediately understand the right terms for each name. This is why we must mentally converse very strenuously, in order to find the right meanings. But for me, this is tremendously strenuous, which is why I already have an unusually large headache after two hours in each case. Hence, I would be very happy if you would give me a break from time to time, so that I can recover a bit. I'm certainly not just soft, but the strains are really very great. Electra says I also wanted to talk with you about that because for me, it's all very strenuous and strength demanding. My head also hurts very strongly every time, and that after only a short time. None of us are used to such overloads. For my part, I only cooperated in this strength demanding way because I adapted myself into your working speed. It is my wish, that you work in a slower manner. Quetzal says that is of correctness, for the overload becomes too great. As you know, I once calculated for you that one hour of such work is equivalent to an output that normally comprises about 20 normal working hours, whereby the average is still somewhat higher than that. Now, if you both work together in this way for 7 to 8 hours a day, then there results a daily work performance of 140 to 160 normal working hours each. This is, however, an achievement that is monstrous and inhuman, but which also can't be answered for, neither by you nor by Electra. Even though you call an earthly body your own, which is very powerful, as we know very well, it also needs many forces. But Electra's body also relies on the forces, even more than yours, because it is more sensitive. You both have forces of a material consciousness related form in approximately the same proportion, through which you can overload your bodies to a certain extent. Nevertheless, you aren't able to do this for a longer duration because your bodies will be injured. With you, like with Electra, I've seen that you were daily at the end of your strength, when you finished working. For this reason, I'm giving you the advice that in the future, you only work together in this way for five hours a day, while you also limit the pace of work and, on occasion, take breaks from work. Even so, you still have to take all sorts of overloads upon yourself, for even in this way, you still daily achieve 100 normal working hours each. Electra says but that would mean that we could work through no more than 200 names a day. Quetzal says that is, indeed, of correctness. Billy says man, then this will take a while, and at the same time, I still have several other books to write. Quetzal says I know that. Nevertheless, everything has no sense if you forcibly destroy yourselves. Billy says then the other books just have to rest and wait. Quetzal says so it will be. Billy says good. Then we'll just continue slowly. Do you also think so, Electra? Electra says I'm glad about that, because for me, it really was unusually strenuous and painful. Billy says if you are satisfied with that, then I'm happy. It really was strenuous and painful, even if the human beings of the earth presumably can't understand that. Quetzal says I don't understand that again. Billy says they still think that thought transmissions of any kind would require little or no forces at all and that all this is practically child's play. 
Quetzal says as long as they haven't even developed these abilities and forces within themselves and can't bring them to application, so long won't they understand these matters and won't be able to grasp them. Billy says so it also seems to me, especially since there are so many frauds in this area, who claim that they would have these abilities. But let's also leave this subject because I still have a question that I consider to be more important. Recently, we talked about Roland, and with this, you told me that you would clarify the matters surrounding him. Quetzal says I've done this, but obviously, you've thought about this in depth. It would, therefore, be interesting to hear what results you've obtained. Billy says I actually didn't want to talk about it because I wouldn't like to sit down in the nettles with such things. Quetzal says that you will not. Electra says I don't understand, what should this phrase mean? Billy says sit down in the nettles. Electra says yes. Billy says we say that we sit down in the nettles or burn our fingers or tread in the dirt when we do or say something that could cause us harm. Electra says but what are nettles? Billy says stinging nettles, my child. Electra says what are those? Billy says nettles, or stinging nettles, are herbs with tiny stiff hairs on the leaves. Upon contact, the tips of these dagger-like or needle-like fine hairs break off, burrow into the skin, and drain their toxic sap under the skin. This, then, causes swelling and an itch-like burning. The nettle is an herbal herb that has an affinity with the so-called china grass, and the nettle also finds use as a medicinal herb. Electra says yes, this herb is known to me, we call it eutic, which, transferred into your language, means that which stings and burns. Quetzal says that is of correctness. Electra says now I understand the meaning of your phrase correctly. Billy says I find that gratifying. Quetzal says but now, tell me what results you've obtained. Billy says if you wish it's all. Indeed, not nice. Very well as I already explained to you once something isn't quite right in Roland's brain. It's clear that a crack is present. But at the same time, he doesn't really use this to strive for reality. That is to say that he can be tempted by his damage in the brain to be mentally lazy as this damage just tends toward that. It means that this brain damage is tendentiously burdened with a mental laziness and causes a mental dullness. Where this damage comes from, I do not know, but it could be repaired by Roland if he would willfully pull himself together and concentratively strive to think properly and act properly. However, he can simply let himself be overrun by this latent tendentious mental dullness, and thus, he goes the way of least resistance. But this inevitably leads to the fact that the tendency of mental dullness and mental laziness expresses itself more and more, by what means he, therefore, falls further and further into the situation of more and more mental dullness and mental laziness and, at last, even totally falls to ruin. This means that he, the longer he isn't willingly and concentratively striving for a true thinking, falls more and more into dullness and laziness. Through this, However, the last remaining will that is still in him also dwindles away, through which he, in turn, illogically goes crazy. But furthermore, this also means that his brain begins to shrink, by what means a stupefaction ultimately makes its appearance. As I see this now, this process has already begun, for a degree of stupidity is already evident. With this, however, the point is also reached where his little remaining reason is no longer accessible, which will mean that sooner or later, he will go crazy and that crazy. This, in turn, means that one can no longer talk with him, as he acquires absurd reasoning, which arises from an inability to reason on his part. From this, it further arises, and indeed, with certainty, that an unreasonable stubbornness will be the result, according to which every good and kind word given to help him will be useless. However, it will have already come this far within the next few days, even though I recently tried several times to bring him back to the right spot. But he defended himself against this with all means. This, 
however, will have the effect that in the next few days, he will indulge in his unreasonableness even further, through which in ten to twelve days at the latest, the bang must come. And I don't see how this bang could still be prevented. The only way that he could begin to think again is that he becomes placed under a psychomedicamentous treatment, through which, together with a suitable therapy, the wrong chemical mixtures in his brain become calmed, by what means his will, in turn, breaks through a little more and can be brought to application by him. Otherwise, I see no other possibility for him. But this would mean that only a loony bin would be his deliverance if he becomes admitted to such in the near future. You see unreal damages are already recognizable, which have resulted from the stubborn unwillingness of not using the brain by means of concentrated thinking. In this regard, I have already somewhat calculated the events surrounding him and have thereby come to the conclusion that he if he goes crazy and escapes from my reach will fall to a state of complete unreality within a few hours, which will be mixed with macular mania and violence. But this will, in turn, have the result that another tendency caused by everything will break through, namely an uncontrolled and uncontrollable malignancy, which means that he can actually become violent in any bad form. Thus, it could very easily happen that he attacks and injures some human beings if something even worse doesn't still happen. So it will take a maximum of three days before he is finally so far that a loony bin becomes certain for him. In fact, in three days at the latest, the police will have to take him into custody, after which he will then, still during the same time, find an admission into a cuckoo home. My calculations have yielded this as fixed results. Quetzal says your results correspond to the complete correctness. Have you also calculated something on the precise time data, when all this will be? Billy says no. Quetzal says I have done that, but that isn't so important. Just do your duty and speak thoroughly with him again. Also, bluntly explain to him what awaits him if he doesn't immediately mobilize his forces and stop all evil. Nevertheless, nothing can be changed anymore, for he has already determined the way ahead. Even before the month of January is over, he will find himself admitted into an institution, which you call a loony bin. Billy says talking with him is, therefore, completely pointless, as I already thought myself. But nevertheless, I will do it, as I have also done this several times in the last few days. But I can tell you, my friend, that it isn't exactly nice to have to do something out of pure obligation, of which one knows that it is pointless. It requires all sorts of forces of the nerves, not to mention the lousy feelings and the waves of thoughts that one is preparing hell. Quetzal says that is of correctness, and the particular evil is still the fact that you have to live among earth human beings who can neither understand these things nor grasp them and who are only too easily determined to make you responsible for these things, due to hatred, jealousy, and ignorance even though, on the contrary, you have tried everything to help Roland and to keep him from what's coming. I still remember very well how the group members tried to shut your mouth at that time, when it concerned his reception into the core group as well as his person and his work. But now, not one of those involved wants to know anything about that. As you all say so nicely on the earth they wash their hands in innocence. But it has never escaped me that up to this hour, not a single core group member has developed any knowledge of human nature in even the slightest way, which is why they all still let themselves be deceived when it comes to assessing human beings. You, however, you who can judge the human beings very well and in less than a second, are defamed and treated as stupid. But this will still avenge itself on the fallible ones, as their relevant time will come. Electra says you live in this world as an outcast. It is a mystery to me, how you keep this up and can still perform your work so intensively. Billy says one gets used to it, little sister. Electra says you are very sweet. Billy says now it starts again. Quetzal says your nature is just attractive. Billy says it seems so, but that doesn't apply to everyone. Quetzal says those who are unable to cope with life, 
scheming, slanderous, truth-shy, envious, hateful, and other negative things, etc. Yes, they are automatically hostile-minded toward you. They do not bear sincerity or sincere love, and to them even the truth is an evil abomination. Billy says that is probably so. But tell me now about the names, how everything behaves with these. I mean of what origin etc are they? Quetzal says the names transmitted to you are exclusively those which have been in use among our peoples for ages and which are still commonly used among our peoples today in a modified form. These names are first names, according to an earthly sense, and each one has a certain meaning. The rule is that for a person who exercises some specific activity, this activity is then added as an explanation to the name. For example if someone had worn T-R-J-J-D-O-N as a name and had pulled ships along the channels, then this human being was named T-R-J-J-D-O-N, who pulls the ships or T-R-J-J-D-O-N, the ship puller. That's how the determinations of the names have arisen. Billy says there are, however, still quite certain emphases of letters. Quetzal says that is of correctness and very important, for only the emphasis of certain syllables results in the correct pronunciation of the name. But in this regard, I'll be helping you with the name lists. Billy says I've also noticed that various names are still common on the earth today, sometimes in well-preserved or partially preserved form. Quetzal says that corresponds to the actual occurrences. Many of the names are still common on the earth today, some in exact, some in modified forms. Thus, on the one hand, the names were received in their entire value, whereby usually only the emphasis changed, but on the other hand, names were changed by newly developed languages or simply by arbitrary willfulness. When these names were introduced on the earth, these were given in eight different languages, which were, nevertheless, all of their own origin. From this, new languages developed on the earth over the course of millennia, from which then, primarily, the oldest languages known on earth arose but these strongly flow through from the original languages introduced. The best known languages that arouse from it are Sumerian, Aramaic, Hebrew, Menon, Celtic, etc. From the Celtic, for example, there arose many other languages, from which, ultimately, today's German language, the Flemish, and also other languages arose. From the Menones, ancient Greek arose and so on and so forth. And in all these languages, of course, the ancient the introduced names were common, which have been received or modified in the course of time. What is still most commonly available today in names is found in those areas of languages that run in the Menon direction and which have been incorporated into the later ancient Greek, by what means they have been preserved to a large part up to this day, though often modified. Then, to all this, there still came names that were invented by the earth human beings themselves, whereby any objects, actions, and work areas, etc. were used for the formation of names. But there were also names that came from the so-called original languages, which means that even then, names arouse for human beings on the earth when the human beings of the earth first learned to speak. As a rule, these were very simple terms, from which, in the course of time, additional terms arose, which then ultimately led to a language. But this was only so in a few cases, for the main part of the introduction of language on the earth happened when the first cosmonauts resided on this world, who mixed themselves with the earthly human life forms, who still weren't strong in their own language. Nevertheless, this goes back a few million years. But I will tell you more about that some other time because today, I still have many other issues to discuss, and this will take several hours. But these things shouldn't be held in writing at a later time. Billy says then get going at once. Quetzal says still, I would first like to explain something about Roland, which I've found out the damage in his brain isn't of a natural kind, as you suppose. It is based on the fact that he suffered an accident as a boy, as he ran into a motorcycle. This accident had the effect that through the concussion, 
which his brain suffered, certain acid cell walls tore and slight mixtures with some bruises occurred. This then triggered exactly what you've explained in such detail. But the fact is that Roland could have become an absolute master over these disadvantages if he had concentratively and willingly striven for progressive thinking. But this wasn't in his mind because this was only focused on an effortless and strain-free life. Another accident occurred at a later date, after which the first after-effects still worsened. Billy says it's good that you say that because Sisai, his mother, told me that I should ask you about it. But I would have now completely forgotten that. However, I think that nothing will change even through this, or... Quetzal says certainly not. But now, we should turn to those concerns, which Electra and I still have to discuss with you. The End